Hey guys, welcome back to Combat Arms Channel. So today's video is going to be pretty short. Um, I have uh, an Airsoft CQB Tactics video that I'm going to be uh, reacting to. So just quick background for myself as far as why I have any any leg to stand on as far as talking about CQB Tactics. Um, in the Marine Corps, I was on the Recapture Tactics team. Uh, I ended up spending uh, 13 weeks at CQB school. Um, so it's it's a pretty pretty solid course. Um, I've pretty much been able to teach everyone, you know, the, the normal infantry as well as army infantry CQB tactics. So the school is pretty tough. Um, they're pretty strict on what you do and and why you do it. They're able to actually explain, so it makes a lot of sense. So uh, if I say something that looks a little weird, I'll explain it to the, the same way that, that that they explained it to me as well. So. Let's get right into it. Um, obviously, it's airsoft. It's going to be a little bit different compared to, you know, obviously training CQB for for real life and actually using real weapons against people who can actually kill you. So, um, yeah, we'll we'll get into it and we'll see. Uh, just the the tactics. Obviously, airsoft. There's less risk going on, but we're we're just going to check out the tactics. So when I'm playing in Austria at different CQB fields, we Austrians are really not specialized in it. We usually play outdoors and there's no team play. It's so real quick, I don't think anyone's really allowed to say that they're specialized in CQB when it comes to airsoft. Um, because there is that inherently lower risk as opposed to real firearms, you're more likely to do things that you wouldn't do, you know, when it really comes down to it and it, it's fine it works out for airsoft however there are a lot of safer ways to do certain things that'll work better in airsoft and real life just for fun there's no okay well we do do it for fun <laughs> uh, but there's there's there basically uh, our standard form uh, usually consists of three people maybe four uh we got the first man the second man and the third man and yeah. each of their roles is going to be a little bit different Okay, so I'll say real quick, uh, whenever you're doing room clearing, you want at least two people just to get either corner. Um, ideally, you get three, and you, you don't really want more than four. Four is usually what you do on an initial entry, but three is a, a good number that you would use for a room clearing. A sort of, it allows you to take down on most of the dangers pretty much as you enter. So, uh, However, their, their stack formation is a little strange. You have the second dude is sort of peeking out a little bit he's like trying to look into the room and you know normally when you're when you're in a stack you want your feet to to mirror the person uh, in front of you unless you're going to be using the flashbang or anything which the two men normally would that one man is going to be completely focused on watching the doorway having his weapon up and being able to engage anything that comes out um, it looks like his muzzle is poking it might be extending past the door frame a little bit, which uh, isn't too big of a deal. However, you don't want any part of you or your weapon to to pass the door frame unless you're actually, you know, you have your weapon up ready to engage just because someone can see it. They know someone's coming. They know someone's about to come through the doorway or come, you know, pie off the doorway. So it's kind of a big no-no. If your weapon or any part of you is passing the threshold of that door frame, you want that weapon up. Just to engage anything that you see. Um, the first guy is gonna come in high, uh, and the second guy is gonna come in low, whereas the third guy will stagger a little bit, delay a little bit, and if things don't go right, then he ends up being the line of defense that we have for that one area, I guess you want to. Let's do the first step until the first two guys inside here, and the guy cuts the line. Let's go. So we freeze the situation. Okay, so before they go into anything, um, this is cool for their specific room that they're using because they already know what the room's like. This is what we call gaming the game. When you know what the layout of the room already looks like, you already know how you're going to handle it exactly. But with CQB, you want to train to the point where you you don't know what the room's going to look like. So if you want the best training possible, you want someone to be able to change the room up take the door from a different um, entrance, sort of 
you know, change it up a lot. So you're having to react as opposed to them. Obviously they've been doing this for a long time and you can't help it sometimes. But when you have two people going the exact same way, one person standing in the doorway, not watching the other side of the, the door frame or the other corner potentially, and you're just gonna end up getting shot up in the doorway. So uh, it's not really helping anyone to see them practicing the same way that they do normally for the specific setup and not explaining what they're doing in the door. Just, yeah, it's, it's a big no-no to stop in the door in general. Situation right now, usually it wants it immediately into the next room. But what about the situation? Why are those positions? Why is one leaning down, one is why at the top, and why is the guy in the back? Okay, well, um, we want to push the tempo. We want to make it. Okay. It's cool to be quick when you know what you're doing, but for people who don't know what they're doing, if you're quick, it's going to be very sloppy. You know, they say haste makes waste. So you're going to run in there. You're going to not. You're not going to be able to react to anything. You need time to react. You know, if you know the setup, that's cool. Half the time, most of the time, you're not going to know the setup, and it's best to not know the setup while you're training because you want to be reactive. You want your brain to react to the layout of a room or, you know, hey, there's a door here, there's a person here, not just immediately run to specific locations. Um, you, you want to be slow and monotonous when you're training. They say slow, smooth, smooth, is fast, and it's a very cliche term, but for CQB, it's, it's very pertinent. You need time for your brain to, to see something and then sort of game it out really quickly and you react just like that. That's how you want to be training, not just you know running place to place. Uh, it works for them because they have worked with the setup before. However, you want to do very, everything very slow with, with CQB. Quick, so what we do is we kind of split uh, the, the coverage low and high. So what you see Larry here, he's gonna be looking down. Um, and he's going to be the one responsible for the lower part. But as well, I mean, in airsoft, it's usually a one-hit kill. So even if he hits a leg, that guy's still out. Um, whereas we got Leslie here, he's going to be looking at the higher level. So in case anybody comes up, maybe peep in high. And the third guy, uh, Alec in the back, he's watching and supporting when needed as well, like we said earlier. Okay, so that third dude, yeah, you can say he's supporting, but why is his weapon up? If someone, if a target does come out and those guys really can't hit them, they're like, they're just not training on their marksmanship and they can't hit them, and this dude has to start shooting, you know, he's literally shooting right past their heads. So, uh, I don't see the point in him being there at all. He's just chilling. Um, if this is a bigger structure, there could be, you know, a hallway he'd just be standing in. You, you don't want someone just poking in the doorway that you came in on, just holding his weapon up, trying to see what's going on. Because he's going to be freaking out, trying to see. He, he might think someone's reacting a certain way when they're not, and he starts shooting. It's just going to be a mess. And they're saying one dude going low and one dude going high. If you just have that dude who's standing up, he's going to be able to see everything. All it takes is for you to do to do that. Like... Someone's looking high, you can get them. If they're like two feet down, it's just a flick of the wrist. It, it really takes no time at all. It's where kind of marksmanship, marksmanship is a huge thing with CQB. If you're, if you're not proficient with your marksmanship, then you're, you're wasting your time. That if needed, he then pulls back to defend. Yeah. Another advantage what I see here is when you have them at different levels, it's not just where they can engage, but also if somebody happens to shoot around the corner, he can't hit them at the same time because they're different levels. If he, you know, go peeks around the corner, shoots high, only one guy gets taken down, and Larry's gonna. That, that's why you get behind cover. Um, you can see the, the dude standing up, he's doing a good job using that tire. Obviously, it's not ballistic, but it's airsoft. He's using that as cover. You want to have as little as little of yourself as possible for them to actually engage. That dude down there, he's shown a lot of himself. So even if the, he ends up like jerk the enemy jerks the trigger or something, he's just putting himself in, in harm's way. The dude standing up can do everything just as well as the dude in the bottom can. I mean, and then it goes down to marksmanship. If you can engage them, cool. Um, it, it, it's cool to have two people in the fight sometimes, so you're not giving up ground if one person needs to, you know, pop down. 
and go in and out of cover, but to to show both of these people at the same time is a little unnecessary. It's not really going to be any more beneficial. Okay, so that video is from uh, Novrich. This next video is going to be from a YouTube channel called Storm Riders. Um, I've seen a few of other videos here when I did the uh, the search, but. Uh, I seem like this one is pretty much the, the bare bones of them trying to teach room clearing, so we're going to check this one out. Hey guys, this is Phil, and today we're going to be taking a look at something many of you have been asking us for, room clearing. Entering and clearing rooms is one of the core tactics of CQC, close quarter combat, but it's also one of the riskiest. Enemies inside a room have a distinct edge over you, and even a perfect room entry can't guarantee that you won't take a hit. So what he said right there is definitely true. Generally with uh, CQB and room clearing, there's about an 85% chance that one man is going to be a casualty. And uh, obviously there's ways to mitigate that, but that's just pretty much going in completely blind, having no edge. So with CQB, you try and um, put the edge more in your favor as much as possible whether you're trying to use uh, surprise, violence, flashbangs, and whatnot. But yeah, it, it's very hard to try and get the upper hand with someone who knows the enclosure already and who's you know barricaded themselves inside. What we're gonna do today is go over the way that our team performs room entry and clearing, and we'll go over some helpful tips and tricks along the way. So let's get to it. The first step to room clearing actually starts with the approach. If enemies inside the room know you're outside and are expecting you to come through the doorway, your odds of success drop dramatically, so it's important to be as stealthy as possible. So that's definitely true. Uh, obviously, you want to try and uh, minimize as much talking, uh, as much of your gear before you go in, uh, try and move your gear around, see if there's anything that's making a lot of noise. And yeah, you, you try and reduce the amount of noise as much as possible, doing hand and arm signals and whatnot. So. Um, this is true mainly so they don't know which direction the assault force is coming from if the uh, assault has already happened and if the assault hasn't happened obviously so they don't uh, hear anything happening as it's happening so it goes into noise and uh, light discipline as well if you have a flashlight casting your light before you actually enter the room so that's a very good point as you approach the doorway, try not to make contact with the outside wall, which can cause your gear to make noise and reveal your presence to those inside. You also need to keep your gun up and ready to engage targets that might emerge from the room, but don't let your gun barrel cross the threshold of the door. Anyone inside will be able to see your barrel and know that you're outside. Additionally, be conscious of any shadows you might be casting on the ground that would reveal your presence. Finally, this goes without saying, but keep quiet. Okay, yeah, so he's saying a lot of stuff that I already said, which is uh, spot on. Um, shadows, uh, I can say for a fact, it's definitely good advice, but uh, that's more for initial entry when you, you aren't um, expecting any threats to present themselves at that point in time. You can focus a little bit more on other things like shadows, but when the assault has began, uh, it's going to be a little bit harder to focus on things like that. So it, the biggest thing is uh, if you have a flashlight, make sure you're not turning on the flashlight before you actually uh, get into the room or you know accidentally hit it or anything like that. But yeah, definitely um, try and stay off the wall. We like to stay off the wall about uh, almost an arm's length. Uh, one, so you're not hitting the wall. And two, whenever projectiles hit the wall, they tend to take low angles and follow um, the wall. So, so you just want to stay away from the wall whenever you can. Use hand signals and nonverbal cues to communicate with any teammates that might be outside with you. Once you get to the door, you'll have a couple different options. Generally, as airsofters, we tend to play on fields that we're familiar with, so having an idea of the room's layout can be helpful in determining what to do next, but let's look at a couple different scenarios. Firstly, in any case where you are certain there's an enemy inside the room who is expecting you to come through the door, the preferred course of action is always to throw a grenade in the room. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point with airsoft. You can use those uh, grenades and everything. If you know someone's in there, just use a grenade. It makes it so much easier. It takes a lot of the, the risk away from you just actually entering, uh, especially if they, they know that someone might be coming. Uh, in real life, uh, depending on where you are, you can always just throw um, a, like a frag grenade inside the room. Um, some units have to 
uh, act with discretion and prejudice. So sometimes uh, a flashbang is uh, all you can use, really. If you attempt to enter the doorway, it is virtually certain that the enemy is going to shoot you. If you don't have a grenade, you should avoid entering in through that door and either find another way in or find some way to distract the enemy. If you're certain there is an enemy inside, but they're not aware of your presence or they're currently distracted, perhaps they're shooting at someone else, the preferred course of action is still to throw a grenade in the room. That was also very good advice. Uh, a lot of times people will hear someone caught up with something, especially in airsoft, and then they'll quickly try and go in. But all it takes is a person to just be, you know, looking back real quick to see someone and even still, they might already be behind cover, so uh, it's very solid advice right there. However, you can also attempt to slice the pie. Slicing the pie is a fundamental CQC tactic, which involves progressively clearing more and more areas of the room prior to entering it, which helps ensure maximum survivability. To slice the doorway, you should stand about two feet back from the entry's threshold with your gun up. You can visually see a little bit into the room and you know that that area is safe. Next, you'll take a small lateral step, revealing a little bit more of the room. If there's still no threat, you'll take another small lateral step, and you'll keep slicing in this way until you either find a threat or you visually cleared the entire room. This is where prior knowledge of the room's layout can help you out. You can look for areas where you think opponents might be hiding. While slicing the pie, it is essential that you keep your gun up and pointed into the room, ready to engage any targets that you come across. You should also keep your elbows nice and tucked in and don't overreach with your feet. The first thing the opponents should see is the barrel and part of your face. Don't be afraid to also lean. Okay, yeah, so what he said about slicing pie or pieing off the doorway, um, I cannot recommend it enough. So with, with infantry units, even in the U.S. Army and the U.S. Uh, Marine Corps, uh, a lot of times infantry will not train this at all, and it's, it's very frustrating because you just have people going into a room that they have no idea what it looks like, they have no idea what's inside at all, and they're just putting themselves in harm's way way quicker than they need to. This, it's a little bit slower, yes, but it's, the, like you said, the survivability is so much higher because one, you can use that door frame as cover. Um, two, you're not exposing yourself. You're only exposing what you need to, which is pretty much uh, your, your face and your, your weapon. And you also get to see what the room actually looks like. So if there is a piece of furniture, you can let the two men know, hey, there's a piece of furniture that you might, you might be running into, or hey, I think I see someone over here, hey, there's a doorway. You can start painting the picture for the people who haven't actually pied off the doorway yet. So it gives you a better idea and it gives everyone else a better idea. So doing this, you pretty much clear most of the room out before actually making entry, while also being able to engage any threats that you might be able to. And like he said, you only want your, uh, your pretty much your elbow and your, your head uh, exposed. You don't want your thigh exposed because a lot of times people will, they'll step out and then they'll start moving over. So they'll actually expose their leg a little bit first. So when you're doing it, so let's say, let's say this is their doorway. You literally just want it so it's like this. This is all they see. And by the time they see it, you know, you can pretty much engage at that point. Um, something that, uh, I know these the Israelis do, but they'll they'll sort of rotate at the hips, so their shoulder and their weapon, as opposed to like this where it's pretty much online, they rotate at the hips so it's a little bit uh, past their leg, and they step with that with that far leg, so the leg on this side, and then they'll start moving over like that. So uh, it's it's just one way to do it, but it's very solid advice. With your torso, if necessary. Once you have finished slicing the pie, make your way through the threshold as quickly as possible and move immediately left or right to the corner that you know the least about or that is the most likely to be dangerous. It's very important not to stick in or around the doorway. Pick a wall and follow it, making sure not to brush up against it with your gear. If this room also has another doorway, keep your rifle covered onto it and move to it, getting ready. That's also very good advice. Uh, the, with the doorway thing, you kind of just have to know your gear and you have to do repetitions of uh, getting through the doorway so you're not getting snagged up. Um, but a lot of times you'll see people, they'll get into the room and uh, you know it's a room they haven't seen before, but there'll be like a doorway or something and they might get tunnel vision on something else and uh, it's always important to lock down those danger areas like doorways and windows and whatnot. You need to repeat the slicing process. 
In any case where you're not sure if there is or isn't an enemy inside the room, your best bet is to slice the doorway. Now, if you have a spare grenade, you can certainly go ahead and throw it in, but most airsofters tend to carry no more than one grenade, and it's best to reserve their use for situations where there is a known threat. Additionally, if you have a sequence of rooms you know you're going to have to clear, you may not want to reveal your presence to other enemies inside the rooms. If you're looking to enter a room with a team, the principles are still the same, but you'll need to coordinate the entry with your teammates. The lead person, that is the person in front, should only start slicing the doorway once everyone is ready to go, and once you move into the room, do not stop. This may prevent people behind you from actually getting into the room, potentially leaving them. So what they're doing there is what we call um, popping 12. So you're sort of pieing it off until you start getting to the point where you're actually walking through the doorway. So that's one way to do it. Um, that's, more, that's a more dynamic way of doing it, just to sort of keep the flow but you definitely want to make sure that you have people behind you. So normally it'll be like a, a, the, per, the two men will give you like a squeeze that comes from the back of the stack. They'll give you a squeeze on the shoulder or they'll give you like a bump with their knee. But uh, yeah, you can see he, he was pieing it and then he sort of went in. That is one way to do it. But another way of doing it is sort of whenever you pie and get across the doorway, you can sort of start pointing things out to, for certain people if there's something that uh, they need to be concerned about. So just so it gives you a little more time to think about everything uh, and, and process everything as opposed to just going right in. So uh, that is a way you can do it, especially if you, if you haven't seen any threats or you're not trying to be as dynamic or, or quick. You can just get on the other side of the doorway, process everything, and then you can either go, so let's say with this doorway right here, if I'm on this side and I have someone on this side, and I pie across over here, I can just go this way and the person over here can just go this way because I'm going to the thing that I haven't seen the, the most of. Obviously coming from this side, you can sort of see everything everything going on over here. So it's pretty much it's gonna be safe for the two man, but you're gonna be taking over, uh, you're gonna be taking the uh, the more dangerous space like he, like he sort of said. Right. Additionally, teammates should alternate whether they go left or right. So if the front person goes left, the next person should go right, and so on. And that's why going across and holding is a, a better way, um, in my opinion, just because it allows you to sort of crisscross. So sometimes you'll see someone, they'll, they'll pie across the door, and then they'll go to the, the corner that they initially saw. So it, it leaves the two men having to react to which direction they're going. You can set a standard, but at the same time, uh, he might go the way that he feels he has to, the one man that is, and the two man has to react. But if the one man just goes across, they can just crisscross it. So I go across, I'm gonna go straight. The two man is already on the other side, so he's gonna go straight. And it's just, it's just another way to do it, but it's not necessarily the right way. Once the room is clear, the team can collapse in on themselves and get ready to repeat the process if there's another doorway. We won't go into team room entries too much, but suffice it to say that effectively entering and clearing a room with a team takes a lot of practice and coordination. Military and law enforcement teams practice room entries consistently in order to achieve and maintain a high level of proficiency. So we've shown you our method for room clearing, and while we encourage you to go out there and practice slicing the pie, it's important to be realistic in your expectations of how this will help you in CQC. Firstly, even performing a perfect room entry will not guarantee your success. The enemy inside almost always has an edge over you, and while practicing room entry will certainly help improve your proficiency, it will never tip the odds completely in your favor. If the enemy inside is expecting you to come through the doorway, the very best odds you should expect are 50-50. Secondly, you need to make peace with the fact that if you enter a room that has an enemy inside it, you will get shot. Even if you slice the pie perfectly, even if you perform a perfect room entry, and even if you actually shoot the other guy first, it is quite likely that they will still shoot you. So that's a very good point, um, especially with room clearing. You, if you have a specific team that you're going to be doing room clearing with, it's best to train over and over again with that specific team so you know what every person does, what their strengths and weaknesses are. Um, definitely with... Um, like he was saying, you, you should expect to, to get shot at. A lot of times with people who are training CQB, it's all fine, they'll do everything fine when they're not actually shooting. But if you have like an opposing force with like uh, training, ammunition, or even airsoft, whenever they start piling off the doorway and they start you know, 
they see someone, they might get like spooked, they'll see someone and they'll sort of just do this as a natural reaction, but you need to have the mindset of being aggressive. So whenever you're pying it off, if you see something, you know, you're taking it. You know, if you see something, you start taking shots, you need to, to trust in everyone behind you and trust the one man as well to be able to engage and actually not just back out of the room. Because when you're backing out, now the, the surprise is completely gone and they know exactly where you're coming from, what you look like, what you have. So uh, it makes it much harder for you. So you need to trust your team for sure. Unlike in the real world where that opponent would actually be dead and unable to shoot back at you, in Airsoft, he will still very much be alive and the adrenaline will be pumping so much they might not even realize that you shot them first. Then if you don't call the hit, you get into a who shot who first argument, which is no fun for anyone. This is why whenever there's an enemy inside a room and we know they're there, we always prefer to throw a grenade in the room rather than enter ourselves. Finally, you need to realize that you will be shooting players and getting shot at from less than 15 feet away and sometimes much closer than that. You need to consider the velocity of your airsoft gun and make sure it's acceptable for use at that closer range and if necessary, switch to a sidearm. We've seen players lose teeth and get BBs lodged in their exposed skin. So it's important to be considerate of other players and play safe. Okay, so that last little bit was just a caveat for, for airsoft. But um, also going with that, CQB is very violent. It's very personal because everything's very close. You see everything. Um, it's not like very far away where you, you know, you're shooting someone and you can't really see what's going on. So CQB is very violent, it's very personal. So uh, if you're doing it in real life, it's something you need to expect with airsoft. Um, like you said, you need to just not be a jerk and shoot someone with a 500 FPS pistol or something. But yeah, all very good points. Honestly, uh, I, I wasn't trying to set a certain bias, especially from that first video, but this video definitely has a lot of critical thinking put in and a lot of actual real life tactics. So uh, I just wanna say kudos. It's a very solid video, very, very solid tactics. Uh, there wasn't really a whole lot that I can complain about. It's just certain nuances, but the tactics are there, the mindset's there. Um, yeah, I have no doubt that these guys are gonna be more successful in CQB than a lot of other airsoft teams that don't really uh, focus too much on the tactics. So yeah, uh, kudos, definitely. But yeah, guys, that's pretty much it for this video. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Um, obviously, uh, I have a lot of experience with with different things as far as infantry is concerned because I've been all over the place as far as Marine Corps and Army. I've done CQB. It's kind of like my bread and butter, what I'm passionate about. And I've also done, you know, normal conventional infantry as well as uh, recon and such. So uh, if you find any other cool videos you'd like me to react to, then by all means, send them my way. Give me some recommendations. But uh, yeah, it's cool to see what people are doing, um, especially with, with things like airsoft. But uh, other militaries for sure it's interesting to see their tactics and their training but yeah i uh, hope you guys enjoyed the video let me know how you feel and uh, like and subscribe if you enjoyed i'll see y'all later